Здравствуйте, у нас сегодня пресс-конференция. Right, so I suggest we get started. Good afternoon. Today's press conference is dedicated to the blocking of the accounts of victims uh, of political repressions. Welcome, everyone. Just a few organizational matters to sort out. If you're a journalist, it would be best to ask questions uh, by either typing them into the group chat, into the uh, common chat in Zoom. Alternatively, you can ask the floor in the chat if you want to ask a question, enabling your video and mic. I will give you that opportunity. And a big question to everyone, especially if you intend to ask questions afterwards, uh, could you please rename yourselves uh, to match the format name, last name, and the media outlet that you represent? As always, uh, in press conferences, there is simultaneous interpretation available. So if you will have an easier time listening to this in English, please feel free to select the globe icon below, uh, select English, in which case you will be able to get interpretation from Yuri. Right, so let me introduce our speakers. This is Alexey Leonchik, uh, representatives, uh, representative of uh, By Help Foundation. Hello, Alexey. I couldn't hear you, but I see you. Image. Yes, what about, how about now? Yeah, I just, I just muted my mic. Yes, yes, hear you, Limit Charlie. Yaroslav Likhachevsky, uh, By Soul representative. Hello. And we have Alexey Lakhnovich, representative for uh, economic reforms. Uh, with Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's team. Good afternoon. And uh, I suggest we give our speakers the introductory address opportunity. We will give the floor to our speakers. Before I do that, I will pass the floor to Alexey Leonchik, who will talk about the history, or give some background, uh, what, what actually happened. Alexey, good afternoon, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. So I recorded a video a couple of days back, and I will reiterate what I said in it. Uh, the day before yesterday, the authorities started blocking uh, the accounts. Some people that got help from our foundation, their, their bank accounts were blocked. We, I am assessing the number of potential victims of this blocking uh, 500, 600 people. This is a very ballpark number because it takes time to sort out and analyze this sort of data. Yesterday, there was a publication of documents where we realized that typically the transfers from my personal account were blocked from my UK transfers uh, to the private accounts uh, in Belarus. These, these were blocked. So this is the most sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, part to analyze because uh, private individuals render assistance. There's thousands of bank transfers uh, from Belarusians that work abroad. They send money to their families and still this money was traced. Nonetheless, uh, this uh, tracing was made possible. So how does it look? What, what, what kind of blockage are we talking here? Uh, the people who received uh, the amounts from me as help uh, because of their status, uh, that amount was blocked. In some cases, some larger amounts were blocked. I also know of several cases where, how do I put this? Uh, the block, uh, it was the, it was not the amount debited from my account that was blocked. It was the whole account that was blocked. Even those accounts that were not uh, somehow implicated in my transfer. Um, I know of several sole entrepreneurs uh, whose uh, legal entities' uh, bank accounts were blocked. Maybe it's in the excess of the bank, uh, maybe it was not. But anyway, uh, the essence remains the same. The banking system does play a role. Uh, they complied with the order of the investigative committee. So I would, uh, and yes, uh, there was a fairly sloppy execution of that order by the banks. They blocked not the amounts that the persons received from me. Uh, so this is, uh, this 
makes me laugh because sometimes uh, this uh, blocking was much more extensive than that. Uh, people's entire accounts and unrelated accounts were blocked. And in some cases, were also uh, there were also threats uh, from the banks uh, that yes, so you you will you will go to court. Uh, they were talking to victims like that. So we are creating a uh, database of people that uh, became victims of this practice. I've already forwarded the people who wanted to work with journalists. Uh, well, I've already referred to the people who wanted to speak out to journalists. This, so this was one of the channels only for, for the addition of the help. This is not, in fact, all of the help. However, first of all, this is a criminalization of private personal transfers. That's one. And number two, uh, some banks went even further. They went an extra mile by blocking uh, entire accounts of people and even threatening them with, with lawsuits uh, when people started calling and demanding their, uh, their, their accounts be unblocked. Okay, thank you, Alexei, for this uh, background. I'd like to pass the floor to Vadim. Unfortunately, I only know his name. Vadim is one of the victims in this situation. So, Vadim, uh, can you please uh, elaborate? Are you prepared to talk to us? Yes, good afternoon. Right, Vadim, could you please talk to us? Would you like to give some introductory statement what happened to you? Well, like with many people out there, uh, I became a victim of uh, violence and torture in the Soviet uh, police department in, in Minsk after the elections. Uh, uh, then I was put uh, into the arrest in the prison. One month afterwards, uh, I, uh, I, I submitted an application to a rehabilitation program. I'm, I'm in Czech Republic uh, on, rehab on, on rehabilitation. And also I filed an application to buy help and I got this help back in early October, a month ago. And at that time, I heard that uh, the money was deduced uh, from bank accounts without any warning uh, for the fine, to, to pay the fine uh, prescribed by the courts. And I withdrew all the money from the cards so that uh, it were empty. And then when this whole story started with withdrawals, I went uh, to my internet banking and that card had one ruble plus and uh, there was 2.9 thousand minus. It was a negative, negative amount. Right. Okay. Thank you. I would now like to pass the floor to Yaroslav Lukhachov. Oh, no, sorry. No, that's correct. I would like to give the floor to Yaroslav Lukhachov. The way I figure he will tell us how he intends to bypass uh, the existing uh, economic and uh, banking system. Uh, good afternoon. Yaroslav, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon again. Somewhere in mid-August, in the third decade of August, we had a paper that was filed to us. Uh, I think it was the investigative committee that signed it. And there was a query, there was a request to the banks uh, to give the information on bank accounts of people who were in that or another form associated uh, with BISOL Help Foundation. In particular, they requested the info from the banks about bank transfers from the accounts that I owe, uh, that I own, I own uh, abroad. This was the first message. This was the first red flag that the banking system is uh, strictly controlled, stringently controlled uh, by the law enforcement. So originally, when by soul was uh, scaling up, we decided uh, to build a structure in such a way to enable other ways, other channels of rendering help. We have a different specifics, we have different uh, kind of cases, uh, unlike by help, so we had this opportunity to render help otherwise. Uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, no secret to anyone, we normally use cryptocurrencies to help the victims of the reprisals. 
Our three-month experience shows that this cryptocurrency focus uh, is fairly effective. We will ramp up efforts in this respect. We will continue doing that. We will also share the experience with our colleagues to make sure that the help is as safe as it gets and to make sure that uh, this money is not pocketed by the law enforcement. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Svetlana Tikhanovska's economic advisor, Ales Aleknovich. Ales, could you tell about the consequences uh, of the violation? Well, I'll be concise in that respect. I'll just start out by saying that the political crisis that is going on in Belarus, that has been going on in Belarus for a number of months now, it undermines uh, the trust uh, in Belarus uh, among all the economic entities, uh, foreign and domestic. The economic system is not being trusted. And this basically uh, drives to economic disbalances in Belarus. What the Belarusian state did yesterday to several, the day before yesterday, to several hundreds of citizens by blocking their uh, accounts and uh, forcing the banks to deduce money from, the, from their accounts. This is definitely not the first violation of the economic rights of the people. This is also a fairly serious and uh, en masse, uh, this, is, this is a uh, mass scale violation. Early this year, we've seen money being withdrawn from or being taken away from uh, the ex-presidential candidate, Mr. Viktor Babarika. Then there was a political oppression against people that cooperated with him, uh, be that renting spaces or, or something else. They could also face imprisonment or uh, have their property arrested. Then there was a situation with Pandadoc where the government uh, took people as hostages to force the leader of the company uh, to stop uh, supporting the law, enforce, uh, law enforcement members uh, that uh, supported the people. Uh, then there are, then there were closures of small businesses, coffee shops, uh, small small stores uh, that uh, closed the doors uh, for one day on October the 26th uh, to support the boycott, to, to support the, the universal strike. And the day before yesterday, there was an actual out and out stealing of uh, the monies uh, from the people's accounts, uh, 500, 600 uh, people uh, that Alexei mentioned. So previously the government uh, used this pinpoint approach, uh, trying to target individuals and uh, indiv individual or specific uh, legal entities. Now we have a mass scale violation. Uh, the property right has been violated by the state. As you know, the property right, or the private property, is the cornerstone of any contemporary economic system. Without private property, there's no and there's not going to be any trust uh, towards the state, towards the economy of that state. Uh, the people abroad and domestically will not invest in the Belarusian, uh, Belarusian economy. Uh, uh, vice versa, quite, quite the contrary, they will start withdrawing the money from the country because they uh, do not believe that uh, their property might not be might not get seized one day by the authorities. Again, so the events uh, of the day before yesterday, this money was taken away from people. Uh, well, it's a special group of people, somebody says. It's a group of uh, victims. These people were victims. They took part in protests and they were helped uh, by the members of the Belarusian diaspora and not just them. So it's uh, not necessarily happening to everyone, but I mentioned these uh, examples about Gazprom Bank, uh, Panda Dock, and now rank and file people. If the government is doing that to fund 500, 600 people, to, the next day they can close 500, 600 businesses. Or they will uh, introduce those uh, trade unions, they will force uh, the private companies uh, to establish trade unions. And the next day they can reach the hand into every other person's pocket. This should not be kept silent, this should not be swept under the rug. Uh, well, we should definitely advocate this case uh, so that the government is reluctant uh, to repeat this, uh, uh, these actions. Uh, this will negatively impact 
the trust to the banking system and to the economic system as a whole. If the government keeps doing that, uh, then the, every, every citizen of Belarus uh, should take the, their own decision how to uh, protect themselves and how to protect their savings. Now every Belarusian has an understanding that everything they keep in the banks uh, is not their property. The government can come knocking any day and uh, seize that money, seize their property. So the decision is up to you. You should understand the risk that you're running. If today people are victimized, even those who showed up uh, uh, after the elections, uh, they took to the streets, they were detained for that and beaten up for that. So that the next day the government can target individuals that are completely apolitical. Thank you, Alice. I would like to remind uh, the journalists that you can uh, write your questions in the chat. Uh, there's uh, also an option to raise a hand in Zoom. You will be able to do that, uh, after which we will we'll give you the floor. There is a question from Dmitry Bobrik, uh, to, to buy portal. Uh, the first question is, will help be rendered to those who got aid, uh, financial aid, but who got their account blocked? I'm talking specifically about people who could not uh, withdraw the money in time. What do people go to? Alexey, Yaroslav, I'm guessing this one is to you. Okay, let me start. By help is looking into options to help people uh, who got the money withdrawn, who got the money taken away. We will publish that uh, anytime soon, possibly within a week. I also know that BISOL also prepared a manual how to help these people. This is still under discussion. But within several days, until the end of the week, we will find opportunities, we will find ways uh, to help people that were victimized by the government again. Once again, so there was a second part. Uh, those people that received uh, requests uh, to show up for uh, questioning. Yes, we will definitely help these people. We find it our duty. And the third bit, the third uh, sub-question of Dmitry, uh, any, any suggestion how the government found this account? Three months after the transfers, three months after our activity, the government finally added two plus two and they realized that the banking system can be exploited to, to somehow try and uh, put a tap on this thing, put a lid on this thing, I mean. So I believe this to be a fairly transparent mechanism, international bank transfer, it's uh, completely possible. This is the easiest thing to trace uh, in the today's environment, but I've never thought that they will actually uh, target uh, individuals well private account transfer to a private account i mean there are thousands of those uh, uh, by people who work abroad and send money uh, to belarus into belarus uh, to their relatives and they have not been targeted uh, before so basically this will affect the perception of the banking system because the banking system is one of the pillars of the economy and we know that the banks keep 5 to 10 percent of uh, funds reserve uh, as a safety cushion to try to uh, or to, to be able to repay uh, or to return the deposits that the people uh, might want to withdraw before term. And basically now we see that the case where your money, the people's money can become the state money at any time. So right now the Belarusian system has displayed its uh, actual face, has shown its actual face. Uh, the people will think twice uh, whether to open a new deposit and whether to wait uh, before withdrawing their existing ones. Yaroslav, yes, I will second what Alexei has said. Uh, this is a blatant violation. We will not stay silent. We will definitely try to find ways out of this situation together how to help people that lost their money. We've created a legal manual on what, what to do in this situation. We will join our efforts to help people 
Fortunately, the number of these people is fairly small at this point, so it will be very easy to verify them and we'll be able to find those who actually uh, require help. And I believe that with our own efforts, uh, with, our, with our joint efforts, we'll be able to do that quickly. Uh, okay, if I may, uh, I will also elaborate. I will support uh, Alexei's points. Something that has happened right now, something that we've witnessed recently, is not through economic reasons, right? So the government pocketed the money, or well, how immoral and how lowly this uh, behavior is. The people got beaten up, they were arrested, and there's another round. Uh, the compensation raised for them by the Belarusians across the world was, was taken away from them. So the government did this lowly act, they violated the basic economic rights, uh, the private property was violated by the state, exclusively uh, through political motives. So if the economic uh, situation is worsening and with unresolved political crisis, there's no way uh, Belarusian economy can stabilize and can grow. These adverse trends, they will deepen month on month. So if already today the government is uh, violating economic rights uh, through political reasons, you can only imagine what the government is going to do when uh, the state is running low on funds to repay foreign debts, to, to pay the salaries to the riot police, uh, to pay for imported products and so on and so forth. You can only imagine what the government would be able to do then if, if things go south in the economy. Right, so next question is also from Dmitry. Uh, the blocking of accounts uh, could have affected up to 600 people. Uh, the, there's more people uh, that benefited through buy help. I mean, it's not 100% of the recipients of financial aid that, got, that uh, got blocked, that had their accounts blocked. No, I've mentioned that the help uh, because of torture, violation, detentions was received by 1,300 people. That's the figures as of November the 9th, 1,300 people. So up to 600 people were affected, according to our estimates. Uh, we never put all the eggs into the one basket. So this is the reason why the majority of people became unaffected, so stayed unaffected. We will continue working in these directions. Uh, some banking instruments, or, uh, establishing new banking instruments to help is not a problem for us. So 1,300 recipients, 600 accounts blocked. What, what, was it 3,300, uh, 3,300 people, not 1,300, sorry. One-fifth of the, of, of the accounts was blocked. 600 out of 3,000 something. So, as I mentioned, there are certain minimal losses because of the currency conversion, because of the transfer costs. So, the government has blocked uh, around 500,000. So, the, I'm not saying that this is a good thing, it's entirely a good thing, but indeed we will work with our standard mandate, uh, trying to render every help possible. Okay, thank you. The question from Jonta Smilovsky from Polish Radio, is it possible to defend or to protect uh, the financial aid uh, to the victims uh, from these uh, funds being captured by the Lukashenko regime? Uh, didn't quite. Okay, I will answer the way I understand this question. As I mentioned and as Yaroslav has confirmed, uh, people who got the money seized, we will uh, render them support, non-financial support. At this point, legal support, yes. Uh, what to do if these people are targeted further? So we will help them in this respect. In parallel, there's an initiative to help people who are completely penniless, uh, who, who had all the accounts blocked. And 
as for the amounts that were blocked, what we're going to do about that, that's that's a question for the later stage. Now we need to resolve a more urgent matter. So personal help, private help, this is what we need to sort out now. And number two, we need to help the people uh, that uh, are victims right now. Right now, we're looking for the ways to resolve this situation. And to defend the money that uh, are sourced uh, or that are arriving to Belarus, in principle, let me put it this way. The day before yesterday, I'll reiterate, I've, I've mentioned that several times, the day, until the day before yesterday, I was unaware of the possibility of the government to block a private transfer to a private account of a private individual. So Myanmar did the same. I will not uh, really give an example of North Korea because they don't have a banking system in the conventional sense of the word. But basically the regimes uh, akin to those uh, have been doing that to their people. So if that was the question, how people can defend their own money, well, it's, it's a question to them. They can withdraw the money, they can invest this money, into something else, not just plain withdrawal. There's a number of instruments, number of tools uh, of investment available. And if I were a victim of these actions uh, by the government on the 10th of November, I would have gone to the bank. So blocking only the amount that, that was received from me, well, block only that amount. No, but the banks have decided to go the extra mile and they blocked entire accounts exceeding the amount of transfer that the people received from me so it's, it's not just the investigative committee so it's, it's also the banking system that uh, overdid it please make feel free to draw your own conclusions Alice? yes so why am i even attending this press conference and speaking here to me as an economist uh, as uh, uh, the events of the day before yesterday also came in as a shock. I couldn't fathom that the government is uh, w w was going to do that uh, violations, uh, that severe violation. Uh, obviously, the government uh, has been engaged in beating people up, torturing people, even killing people. Now they've done another step. So the economic matters uh, can seem secondary at the backdrop of those other more serious violations. However, purely economically, the thing that happened the day before yesterday, uh, private funds seized by the government is one of the last steps, uh, the last resort steps that the government can afford. I realized or I imagined that this could be possible, but uh, only as a last resort uh, step when Belarus is uh, lacking funds, uh, is lacking the gold reserves uh, to support the foreign, uh, to, to, to support the local currency, uh, to, to repay the foreign loans. Yes, in that case, the government could have gone for blocking the foreign accounts or foreign currency deposits of, of the citizens. I couldn't imagine this happening in the setting when the economic situation is not as bad. The government simply violated uh, basic economic law. And the question that came in from the Polish radio colleague, well, it's even difficult to imagine how to counteract that when such basic, such, such basic rights are being violated. One of the mechanisms, uh, I, I believe Alexei can talk about one of the mechanisms to counteract that, what is uh, in the pipeline right now, how we can try and bypass the existing banking system. Okay, thank you, Yaroslav. Uh, Yaroslav, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll be pleased to elaborate. So, let us face the facts. The government is no longer fulfilling the functions uh, that it's supposed to fulfill. The only function that it uh, maintains is repressions. Reprisals, terror, uh, torturing, it's definitely not something that the government is supposed to be doing. So the only way out uh, of this, the only solution for us is to create parallel system, parallel infrastructure, 
that will uh, uh, help Belarus function as a state. It's a good occasion today to talk about uh, creating an alternative economic system. Unfortunately, it cannot be created overnight with a snap of a finger. It's a, lo it's a long path. From what we see, the existing banking system is no longer able to serve uh, to the best interests uh, or to serve the best interests of Belarusian citizens and uh, secure the funds uh, resting in their accounts. For this reason, we need to consider the alternatives. And the experience we have been getting over this uh, three-month uh, operation history of the funds, we see that cryptocurrencies, no matter how weird it might seem, no matter how innovative or how far-fetching it, uh, far it might seem, cryptocurrencies are working in a stable manner and they help uh, get the money to, into Belarus and uh, help the citizens on site. I used to be a very serious uh, skeptic of cryptocurrencies before the whole thing started, but uh, the life has shown that this ecosystem does work in challenging conditions. So, as I've mentioned, we're moving towards further cryptocurrency involvement. The first step that we're going to do is me and the colleagues from the Golas from Voice, we will create uh, the digital solidarity platform that will consolidate the bulk of the funds. It will consolidate the main foundations, it will consolidate the processes and manage the risks uh, that we see manifesting today. So we will work in a centralized manner to manage the risks, to avoid the situations of the day before yesterday in the future. We will rely on existing cryptocurrency solutions to fulfill the tasks at hand. We've been talking to Alice now actively how the structure might be scaled up in the future, how the structure can be built and scaled up in the future so that Belarusians have access to other financial tools, other technological tools uh, to help them use and save their money, to not be dependent on the Belarusian state represented by the current regime, to not be dependent on the Belarusian banking system that is uh, fully controlled by the government and that will help them uh, maintain safety of their savings and their money transfers. Keep the money safe, basically. Right, there's a question from the UK embassy in, in Minsk. Considering the fact that the blocked uh, transfers uh, were happening through Belarusian banks, uh, do uh, Belarusian foundation members believe that the government will go to the UK authorities uh, to try to investigate and further press uh, or press against the fund? Alexey, I guess this one is to you. Yeah. I always expect the worst. Well, definitely, they will try to, well, make our life as bad as they, as they can, as hard as they can. We know that this has been happening in 2014. There were requests uh, to European banks to target Ukrainian volunteers. Normally, there was a short-term arrest of the account because the organization was uh, quite sloppy. The Belarusian organization of this process even is even more sloppy, is even sloppier. So I don't believe there will be further continuing problems. First of all, yes, uh, the Belarusian authorities can file an application to the UK authorities easily. Yes, they can do that. The question is, uh, whether this response, whether this application will be granted, maybe they will try to uh, they, they will try to uh, 
have me uh, as a foreign citizen, was as a Belarusian citizen on foreign soil. They will try to extradite me, uh, to have me extradited, but well, that, uh, that, that they will not be able to do that. Alessi, Yaroslav, any, any liberation on you from your side? No. Well, in that case, there's another question from Dmitry, uh, from to, to be why. Could you please tell us about the state of affairs with new applications, the status quo of new applications? Is the number dwindling? Uh, how are you processing the previously received applications? Uh, so why does it take so much time between the application and the transfer of the funds? Well, the situation with new applications is uh, doing great. There's even more of them coming our way. It's a fairly stable number, around 180 80 to 100 applications per day. However, judging by the events of the last weekend, and I believe that there's going to be further aggravations, I'm reading a story of one guy that was particularly victimized. So I believe that these filings will continue. There will be more applications. We're looking at uh, up to 100 applications per day. Some of them are repetitive. Some of them are uh, from the persons that are filing applications to us and to other foundations uh, that help uh, pay out fines. 50 to 70 actual persons, unique persons uh, per day. This, this is the number of applications. Previously received applications, how they're processing. Uh, we keep processing this without delays. Uh, we, we, we will do some damage control, definitely. But even in the past two days, we did not stop processing the applications. As far as I know, uh, two weeks ago, well, I don't have the recent stats, but two weeks ago, uh, the lag uh, between the application and the money transfer was three weeks. The delay. If the request was direct, the payment could have happened uh, in the coming two weeks. So three weeks is the worst case scenario. Answering your question, why does it take so much time? Well, that's the number of applications that's coming in. There's too many. Possibly we will, well, I couldn't automate this process because uh, the applications are different. Uh, the amounts range from 15 Belarusian rubles to a thousand. Quite a number of people opened an account uh, to just get the money from me, to just get the compensation from me to, to pay out the fine and forget about it. So it's quite a big number of people uh, that uh, need uh, help with paying the fines. I also remember then in late October, early November, uh, our leg was about eight weeks. So application to payment was almost two months. Essentially, we've reduced these time frames to number of days. Unfortunately, the audibility is not too good. We can get the delay to four weeks, down to four weeks, but this is this is the best uh, case scenario. Uh, as I see the number of applications in our current capacities. I would also like to say this. We're also uh, paying out uh, the money so that the people can pay a penalty on the uh, overdue fines if the penalty was awarded. Well, 
то э, такая заявка, которая, ну, называется у нас заявка в кризисе красная, она сразу же прибегает к верху. An application in crisis, a red, a red flag, uh, we prioritize If the situation becomes critical, so the, we, we prioritize this application uh, for where a fine needs to be paid quickly. And uh, we try to help as fast as possible. Yaroslav, uh, this same, these same questions, uh, could you talk about how BISOL operates? New applications, the number, how the trend is looking, and uh, what you're doing with the processing of the previously received applications. Well, fortunately, we don't have as many applications as by help does. There was a surge after October the 26th, after the people's ultimatum, when there were mass firings, so people were dismissed and mass from state enterprises. The number of applications tripled and quadrupled in some points, daily uh, amounts daily numbers. Uh, these days, those days were quite tough for us, quite hard. Now we're receiving about two to three dozens a day, and we process them in a standard manner, routinely. We also realize that every day we have 20-30 people who are fired for political reasons, and we should also realize that it's, it's not all of them that are filing applications to get help. Many of them are afraid. Many of them have been brainwashed by the state propaganda and they believe that uh, this is the money of some foreign puppeteers and not the money raised by the Belarusians for the Belarusians. So this number is quite relative to 20, 30 people a day. But the number of people who lose their jobs uh, is uh, not dwindling. There's uh, as, as many of them as they used to be. Essentially, we process the applications routinely. We don't face the necessity to expand the volunteer staff. And uh, everything is working according to our processes. The number of applications is not dwindling. Uh, something else I need to point out. Uh, from the early this week, we, start, we stopped uh, receiving applications and helping the law enforcement members uh, that leave service. Uh, we did the math and we considered uh, that it will be enough for the law enforcement to, to make up their minds so which side they're on. Uh, BISOL stopped receiving applications from them uh, when we announced this decision. So they had three months to, to make up their minds which, which side they're on. If they couldn't uh, until then, twice uh, applications from Grodno that we received over the time frame so that the government is lying openly. It's a good thing that we can, can catch them red-handed. So there are applications coming our way and there are payouts. Okay, there's also a question from you, uh, to, to you. Can you talk about uh, the help to strike committees? Uh, how can you, how can you talk about the assistance? Well, the question is about uh, the strike committees. How, how can you help them? Well, the mechanic is quite clear here. We have certain people that get fired, and everything is clear there. Uh, standard disbursement amounts uh, announced by BISOL, 1,500 uh, euros for every, to, to every resigned person. But oftentimes, people are not fired from the enterprises uh, for certain reasons, because uh, this could be a key employee or because a riot policeman is not going to go into the mine to work the mine and the ideology worker will not operate an inst instrument, complex machinery. And there is a trade union that protects these people from, from being fired. Uh, so these people join uh, the strike, uh, but uh, they stay working uh, at the enterprise and they remain activists. According to our labor legislation, oftentimes uh, the 
earnings of an employee is typically their, their wages and the bonus. And it comes uh, as no secret that uh, the bonus can be up to 70 or 80 percent of their salary, of their wages. So at the management's discretion, they can be deprived of that bonus. And instead of 1,000 rubles, uh, they will get uh, 200 or 300 rubles. Uh, thus, uh, they are deprived of the opportunity to feed their family and to feed themselves. In this situation, we encourage people to self-organize in enterprises. Uh, we encourage them to make lists of people economically repressed in the enterprises and file these lists to us. And they identify the amounts that the people fail to receive in the specific month because of uh, they do the math of the money under-received by a person because of their political views. And we repay the amount that the person was deprived because of the economic uh, sanctions, economic measures uh, taken against them by the management of the enterprises. So to, to, technically, we uh, pay, uh, we give people back something that was stolen from them by the state. Okay, there's a second question. The first question was, how can you assess uh, the impact of the funds on the course of the protests? And there's a related question to Yaroslav specifically, how do you work with enterprises, say, following October the 26th? Uh, how does, how has the situation changed in the factory uh, in terms of the headcounts of the strike committees? Okay, you go ahead and I will continue. Well, the situation is changing constantly starting August when there was a first wave of uh, chaotic strikes. So, well, people were under emotions and they went on strike. Then they were pressurized uh, by the management of the enterprises, by the ideology workers there. Uh, after October the 26th, there was a new wave that, of, of strikes that ended in mass uh, firings and mass, mass dismissals. In many uh, enterprises, uh, the active members of the strikes uh, were removed, were fired. What we found out as we were working with the uh, uh, factories, plants, uh, the workers are afraid of uh, being deprived of their daily bread and the opportunity to keep the food in the tables and the family's tables, uh, then they're, they're, they're less afraid of the right police uh, batons. So we are supporting them and uh, ensuring economic uh, safety for them, financial security for them. I can also say that uh, solidarity and self-organization in enterprises is growing stronger. In August and September, this was more, mostly chaotic, sporadic. Uh, now people are being trained how to, they are educating themselves how to counteract uh, the state system and the ideological system. They start talking more to, uh, stop talking more among themselves uh, to each other, uh, consolidate and help one another in the first place. It's important to understand that because at some enterprises where uh, the salaries are a bit higher and the uh, economic situation is better, they almost never go to uh, mutual help funds. They create their own. Uh, they create their own funds uh, for solidarity. This is a great thing because people actually stand up for one another. They help each other defend their own rights. Unfortunately, again, this kind of work is not done overnight. This is a lengthy process. It took 26 years, the people were divided, and the people were forced not to trust one another. Now we need to overcome all that. The funds, uh, well, let's uh, speak honestly here. In the scale of the state, BISOL has rendered uh, this assistance to 1.6 million euros. That's a drop in the sea. 
Sometimes, as the old proverb says, uh, uh, a drop can be enough to overflow the cup. A single drop will make the cup run over. Everyone knows that there is opportunities of help. There is There are ways how Belarusians can help one another. So I believe that the funds uh, do the right thing, do everything correctly. And the impact of the funds is significant. It helps people feel more secure, um, be more calm. Okay, Alexei. Could you please repeat the question once again? Well, can you can you assess uh, the impact of the funds on the protests, on the course of the protests? Right. So we start. We say we've been saying at the very beginning, and by we, I mean by by help, and particularly myself. By help is a is an exclusively humanitarian. Uh, initiative, no matter what the investigative committee might have drummed, uh, drummed up. Uh, well, they've been thinking about us uh, a lot recently. However, by help, by soul, by help is a solely humanitarian association. Both funds, the, regardless of the target audience, uh, they create the feeling that the Belarusians are not going to abandon uh, the fellows, the fellow brothers and sisters who went out on protests and strikes and uh, they, were, they were fired and uh, deprived of means, uh, for exist, means to existence. The difference in mandates of the funds, it's a very clear message that the Belarusian society has self-organized and the people are actually uh, prepared to help one another. I'll reiterate, by help is a completely humanitarian initiative. Uh, the monies uh, that we've been sending were intended for humanitarian aid. For by soul, these solidarity payouts are not an issue either. And I suspect uh, that these, the fact that these payments exist and are possible, it, it, it is a certain factor for people in their decision making, to go on strike or not, to, to protest or not. Thank you, Alexei. Well, dear journalists, uh, this is the last uh, chance for you to ask a question. Alice? Yes, I will just conclude, uh, unless there are further questions. No, I don't think there are any questions right now. Maybe it's five, five minutes remaining. You can you can go ahead now. Okay, this uh, has not been voiced, and I will just uh, voice personal gratitude uh, to Yaroslav, to Alexei, to, to what the teams have been doing. Dozens of volunteers that are doing it free of charge, uh, doing it day in, day out, every day, every night. Uh, they do it from the sincere heart. So now, instead of asking questions, why did it happen? Why did this funds got confiscated? Uh, so I will just thank them uh, for what for everything they've been doing and to support them and to support the hundreds and thousands of people in Belarus uh, that are uh, victims uh, that are doing this uh, for themselves and for every single one of us. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, yes, please, Alexei. I would like to ask, on the part of the Bike Help, we've never claimed that we are the only organization out there that wishes to help, and we are kind of a monopoly, monopolized this, this kind of aid. You know that there are other types of help rendered by other foundations, uh, paying fines, helping people pay fines and so on. It's important for us that we and BISOL are an example of self-organization. We can also help uh, administratively. Uh, some people claim that the funds uh, do not operate. Well, the funds do operate. It, it, it's just uh, 
in some cases, it's not uh, the funds that, that people get aid from, it's, it's, it's their own felt Belarusians uh, elsewhere. So we'll continue working. If you see that uh, something can be done faster directly, we'll self-organize and go ahead with that. Well, uh, the more of us are out there, the better the, better the situation is going to be. I'll just reiterate that we will continue to work, we'll continue to uh, pay people compensation to help them pay out the fines. I'm reading about this ultimate case. Uh, there's a problem once uh, when one person is Roman, Roman is in a coma. So we will we'll continue helping people in need. Alexei uh, was. The last question to Alexei: uh, Can you comment uh, on your status as a suspect in the criminal case? What kind of aftermath do you expect? Well, what is there to to comment? Uh, there's so many criminal cases. <laughs> one, one more, one fewer. The government is likely to. Uh, file a criminal suit to, to, to launch a criminal investigation against any person who did anything against them. This uh, discontent uh, with what the government is doing, it has spread uh, throughout all the society. So, well, rendering assistance, medical assistance uh, to people that have already been tortured, rendering financial assistance uh, to people who were unjustly accused and forced to pay fines. We will, we will not abandon these people. We will, not people. we will not abandon people requiring medical aid. We are supporting them in every way possible. I can guarantee that we will continue doing that. Well, what else is there to comment? We can only continue working, keep working. And yes, we will see how it goes. I have a question from Tamara Zenina from Solidarnost. Uh, how many law enforcement members uh, have appealed to you for help? In total, we have had 461 person, persons. Uh, so these are the people that uh, filed an application, recorded the video address, and they uh, attached uh, documents uh, on, the, on them being fired, on, the, on their resignations. But again, I would just like to emphasize, this is a portion of uh, the law enforcement members that were fired. A lot of them are scared, especially in smaller towns. Uh, they were threatened uh, that if they go to any help, or, or to any fund uh, for help, they will not be left alone. They are afraid of recording a video address, they are afraid to show the documents. Uh, some people have been brainwashed by the propaganda again, so this, this, is, this is the money buy foreign puppeteers and you will sell your motherland some or something so that means that uh, these uh, 461 persons uh, is just a fraction of the law enforcement members that left the force over the past months so the number that we can operate safely is 461 applications uh, that came to us uh, during these three months okay thank you in that case i would like to thank all the speakers uh, Thank you, Alessi, Raslav, Alexei. Thank you, Vadim. We will send out this video to all the attendees of the press conference. I would also like to use this occasion and say that tomorrow there's going to be a press conference involving uh, the editors in chief of uh, four key Belarusian independent media. Please feel free to stay tuned, ask your questions. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and all the best in principle. Until we see each other again.